but shows up also as infrared emission. Now we're going to swing over to NGC 6302, also called the Bug Nebula or the Butterfly Nebula. This one is a bipolar planetary nebula in the constellation of Scorpius. It is one of the most complex planetary nebulae ever observed. The spectrum of NGC 6302, the bug, shows that its central star is one of the hottest objects in the galaxy, with a surface temperature of over 200,000 Kelvin, implying that the star from which it formed was very large. The central star cannot be observed and is surrounded by a really dense disk composed of gas and dust, which you can see in the middle, and it makes it look like a pinched waistline for the nebula. This dense disk seems to have caused the star's outflow to be forced into this hourglass-like shape that you see. Just like many other prominent planetary nebulae, it's filled with ionization, where in the form of walls and knots and there's sharp edges to these lobes. And this bug is located approximately 3,400 light years away. And the super winds from the thermal pulse AGB era, combined with the intense UV emission of the core, have accelerated the wind of material up to 600 kilometers per second. This amazing image was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope after the successful 2009 servicing mission and was a showcase image of that wonderful telescope's upgrade. Next on our tour is the Helix Nebula, which is located in the constellation Aquarius. Discovered around 1824 by Carl Harding, the Helix is one of the closest of all the bright planetary nebulae. The distance was measured by the Gaia mission to be about 650 light years, well within the easy grasp of this parallax studying telescope. At this distance of 650 light years, with an angular size of 25 arc minutes or half a degree, it gives a physical size of about 0.8 parsecs or two and a half light years across with an expansion rate of about 31 kilometers or 30 kilometers per second, you can then make a good determination of its age to be about 11,000 years. Due to its unique appearance, you've probably already seen it or heard it called the Eye of God or the Eye of Sauron. Personally, I've enjoyed the Lord of the Rings since I was little, so I'm leaning towards Sauron staring at us. Again, you can see the core at the center of the nebula, it's worth just pausing for a moment and thinking about the fact that this core is not much bigger than the Earth, but yet its temperature is so high that its luminosity is incredible and it can ionize all that gas all the way out to about a light year in every direction. This means that if you travel in a spaceship within about a light year of this nebula and entered the gaseous wisps, your ship would be steadily ripped apart by the ultraviolet light coming from that core. Another name for my astronomy class is A Million Ways to Die, and this is one of them. Finally, in our tour, we go over to the constellation Lyra and view the Ring Nebula, M57, Messier 57. This is one of the great images by the Hubble Space Telescope. This favorite target for summertime amateur astronomers and early fall school star parties is a really tiny target in a telescope, being only about one arc minute across. That's 25 times smaller in the same eyepiece than the previous Helix Nebula. Even though it's extremely far away, at about 2,600 light years, or about 800 parsecs, that places it only about 30% farther away than the Helix Nebula, which means it's much smaller than the Helix in a telescope then, not because of the distance, but because it's only been expanding for about 1,600 years. This is a much younger planetary nebula than all the previous three, and what's fun about observing this nebula with a small telescope is using a special filter called an O3 filter, which looks at the specific wavelength of light that are emitted by strongly ionized oxygen in an extremely tenuous gas. The filter clearly shows the massive presence of oxygen. In this image, the bluish green is the oxygen, the reddish areas come from ionized nitrogen. These elements are commonly created in solar mass range stars as they climb the asymptotic giant branch. Coming back out, I've been talking about the cores of these stars illuminating the surrounding nebula. That core is a carbon-oxygen electron degenerate gas that is now called a white dwarf. Typical white dwarf temperatures are around 100,000 Kelvin, and their sizes are about the same size as our home planet Earth. 
Again, these nebulae are huge, spanning light years, and this tiny, tiny hot object is so incredibly fiercely hot that it's ionizing all that gas. As part of this ionization, when the freed electrons encounter an ionized atom with a free slot, the electrostatic attraction will grab that electron, and the electron will give up the energy of being captured in the form of light. The frequencies and intensities of the light tell us all about the composition of the star that created that nebula. We now see the star turned inside out, with all the material that was for billions of years trapped in the core now being flung out into space. This, then, is the final stage of our story of a sun-like star. The nebula has now fully dispersed, and the contracting carbon-oxygen core has become so dense that it is now a fully degenerate electron gas. Again, just like with the helium flashes, the pressure becomes independent of the temperature, so the pressure grows rapidly and soon counteracts gravity. The collapse halts when the radius shrinks to about Earth size, and we call this degenerate core, again, a white dwarf. For the Sun, deep in its future, the bare core will be about 40% of the mass of the Sun. Remember the luminosity equation, where the luminosity of stars is proportional to the surface area times and the temperature to the fourth power? White dwarfs are incredibly hot, but they're also really small. This means that their luminosity is tiny, and that means they cannot cool off with any great ease. The white dwarf that was the sun will now begin a long, long, slow cooling phase that will last for nearly a trillion years as it fades away into a long night. But wait, the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. This means that not a single white dwarf that has ever been created has turned into a completely cooled off black dwarf. The universe is simply not old enough for a single white dwarf, or any white dwarfs, to have cooled off even to the temperature of the surface of the sun. So every white dwarf that's ever been formed in the history of the universe still is a white dwarf and is incredibly hot and still emitting huge amounts of ultraviolet light. To learn more about white dwarf stars, see my lecture video series on that very topic. It's important to now look at the, an amazing result of all this stellar nucleosynthesis. As I described before, some really surprising elements do come out of low-mass stars dying on the asymptotic giant branch. Elements like strontium, molybdenum, tungsten, and even lead are copiously produced during the late AGB time due to the S-process nucleosynthesis. These elements are created in such stars by the excess abundance of neutrons created by all that carbon burning and oxygen burning. Since neutrons don't carry electric charge, they can easily interact with other nuclei. And if the total flux of neutrons isn't too great, meaning that the nuclei aren't getting hit by the neutrons too frequently, then these heavy nuclei, which are frequently radioactive, have a chance to decay into other nuclei before they absorb another neutron. This is why technetium-99 is seen in the spectra of older red giant stars. There are no stable isotopes in nature of technetium, which you can see lies in the middle of the periodic table. And specifically, TC-99 is the most abundant isotope seen in the atmospheres of thermal pulse AGB stars. And it has a half-life of only 200,000 years. So, this dredge up that we've been talking about brings up truly deep material to the surface from very dense regions, which is then expelled out as part of these planetary nebulae. Most of the carbon and nitrogen and lithium in the universe was made in such dying stars. The carbon that makes up the DNA of your cells was made in some ancient star long since dead over four and a half billion years ago. Oddly, most of the mercury and lead were also created in this way, as well as a good fraction of the silver and gold in your jewelry. 